thank you everyone for joining us tonight for a discussion on the climate emergency and hopefully finding some hope and reasons to be optimistic about the future. First, as always, I want to acknowledge that I am coming to you from the traditional and ancestral territories of the Coquitlam First Nation. I'm Ian Bushfield, the Executive Director of the BC Humanist Association. Tonight, we're pleased to be joined by Emiko Newman from the BC Climate Emergency Unit. And we're going to be talking, of, as I mentioned, about the climate emergency. Humanism, as you know, is a worldview based on free inquiry and the power of science and creative imagination. One of the core principles of humanism is recognizing, you know, we have one life to live and this is our one world. And so I think that compels us to care about this world and this future. And, uh, you know, a passion for the environment is one of the 10 commitments of humanism as the American Humanist Association has put it out there. And so I think the urgency of tonight's talk is not lost on those attending either in person or later as they listen to this either on our podcast or on our YouTube. The BC Human Association as well as the BC Climate Emergency Unit are um, nonprofits that are funded entirely by individual donations. Actually, I don't know fully about your unit, but we are funded entirely by individual donations. So if you can become a member, support us, bchumanist.ca slash join and bchumanist.ca slash donate to make a one-time municipal donation, one-time donation. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Amiko Newman in a second. She is a, I'm just looking at your bio and you just have this like wealth of fascinating history from working in anti-racism, researching on environmental and sustainability and teaching piano. Uh, you've been working on policy, you do field hockey, uh, just, you know, a very fascinating life that you've lived and working now in the field of environmental justice. And so I'm very pleased to welcome you to talk about the climate emergency campaign and your work at the Climate Emergency Unit and why we should be, why we should be hopeful. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. And I'm so glad to see all of you here. Thank you for agreeing to come spend your Tuesday evenings together with me. My name is Emiko, as Ian mentioned. I am the coordinator of the BC Climate Emergency Campaign, and I am here to talk to you tonight about tackling the climate emergency. Huge task we have ahead of us. I'm gonna start off this evening by just giving a very brief background about who I am. We'll get into some context setting, just talking about where we are in time. I'll give you some information about the BC Climate Emergency Campaign. We'll get into different um, actions that we can take, solutions. We'll uh, briefly talk about false solutions, and then we'll have time for questions at the very end. So just to give you a little bit of background so you know who's speaking to you tonight, I uh, started off with an undergraduate degree at Simon Fraser University. Most recently, I got my master's degree. I studied social justice education with a a specialization in environment and health. I've done work as an anti-racism workshop coordinator, as Ian mentioned. I've been a research assistant on environmental and sustainability education. And I've been the coordinator of the BC Climate Emergency Campaign since 2021. And uh, it's been a real pleasure getting to work on this campaign alongside so many fantastic folks who are doing such great work on climate. I have learned so much, and I'm happy to be here tonight to share a little bit about those learnings. So to begin with, where are we now? What's happening in the world around us? I'm sure we all know that this has been a very devastating summer in terms of climate disasters. This was the hottest summer in recorded history and could very well be the warmest year the Earth has seen in 120 thousand years that's that's saying something that is uh you know basically since humans have been on this planet we are now at a point where canada's forest is starting to release more carbon than it has stored typically our forests have been um absolutely crucial for storing the carbon that we've been emitting we're at this point now due to wildfires, deforestation, 
that uh, the forests are releasing more carbon than they're able to keep in. This summer alone, there have been uh, 25,000 square kilometers burned due to wildfires. And it's estimated that that is going to equal uh, more than two and a half times the emissions from all of the sectors in the Canadian economy combined. So absolutely horrific what we've been seeing. And um, that's not to talk about the death toll, the number of people who have been injured in the climate disasters, the number of people who have lost their property, who have lost animals, who have lost farmland, etc. Some of the uh, the heading headlines we've been seeing in the newspapers are pretty scary. These ones from CBC and The Guardian and Forbes talking about the the damages that have been been done as well um, financially, the huge record breaking costs of these climate disasters that we've been seeing. Uh, it, it all seems pretty grim. And of course, we know what is causing these climate disasters. We know what's behind all of this, all of these uh, extreme weather events that we're seeing. It's the burning of fossil fuels. 99% of scientists now are able to state that equivocally, that we know that it is human activity. It is the burning, it is the extraction and the production of fossil fuels that is causing these disasters that we're starting to see. Uh, fracking being part of that. And I want to just state here, uh, I am not a climate scientist. I do not pretend to be an expert on climate science, uh, but I wanted to draw your attention to an absolutely fantastic resource, which is Dr. Kate Marvel. She works with Project Drawdown. Uh, she is a senior climate scientist. And a few months back, she gave this absolutely amazing talk on understanding and correcting Earth's troubling climate trajectory. So if you would like to get more information later on about the exact causes of climate change, as well as what is not causing climate change, this is a really, really great resource. You can find her talk by looking it up on YouTube or going to the Project Drawdown website. And I would really recommend doing so. Whether you know a lot about this topic or a little, I can guarantee you'll have something to learn. So thanks to Seth Klein for her for putting this together and a little shout out to Greta Thunberg. Uh, but you can see here that this is Canada's um, national emissions for the past 20 years. And it's quite obvious that nothing much has changed. You look at the 2021 numbers compared to the 2000 numbers, they are almost the same with slight dips here and there, uh, especially 2020, you can see it went down a little bit. Of course, that was due to closures from the pandemic, but crept right back up again in 2021. Same story for British Columbia. In the province, we can see that not a lot has been done to bring our emissions down to start to bend the curve. And of course, this is a huge problem. You might say that this is the sort of situation we are being faced with right now, uh, when a lot of our leaders are mired in this new form of climate denialism, where they may not be outright denying that the climate is changing. They might even declare a climate emergency, but the very next day they are continuing to approve new pipeline projects or new LNG terminals. And that is not the type of climate leadership that we need to be seeing at this point in time. So to lead us into the next part of this talk, I wanted to share this, this uh, tweet by Antonio Guterres, who's the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. He recently said that our planet has just endured the hottest summer on record. Climate breakdown has begun. We can still avoid the worst of climate chaos. We don't have a moment to lose. And I wanted to share this because I think this is the perfect sort of narrative that we have to be spreading. 
uh, he hits it right on the head when he says that climate breakdown has begun. He is not hiding the fact that we are in a climate emergency. He is being honest. He is telling the truth that this is not something coming down uh, the line in future years. This is something that we are experiencing here and now today. And Canadians across the entire country experienced that this summer. People around the world experienced that this summer. Uh, you know, millions, if not billions of people are, are already feeling the effects of a warming climate. This is the truth we have to be telling. This is the emergency mode that we need our leaders to be in. This final line that he says is equally important when he says that we can still avoid the worst of climate chaos. It is not doing anybody any favors to be mired in climate anxiety, in, in despair. Of course, it is a completely natural reaction to feel anxiety about the state of the world, about the state of the climate, uh, to feel scared, to feel anxious, to feel nervous about what's coming and, and what we're already facing. Um, but that being said, we cannot let those, the, those emotions drag us down. We have to be still willing to act and we have to be as courageous as we can right now. So that brings me to the climate emergency campaign. And then, uh, you know, there are so many fantastic organizations and groups out there working so hard on climate. And I wanted to talk to you about, about this campaign because it's the one that I know the best. And it is the one that uh, I, can, I can give you the most detail in terms of what we are working on, what sorts of solutions that we are seeking and what sorts of things we are asking for from our leaders. What is the campaign? We are a group of civil society organizations anxious about the climate emergency who are collaborating to increase the ambition of climate policy and action in BC. When we came together with the shared understanding and the shared belief that our province's greenhouse gas emissions are simply not decreasing at the speed that the crisis requires. We share a belief that BC's climate plan, which is called Clean BC, it needs a profound jolt. It needs to be transformed into a genuine emergency plan. And we need to be forcing the provincial government to take real action on climate change. The BC Climate Emergency Campaign came together in 2021 and the founding groups penned this list of 10 urgent actions that they put into an open letter and sent to the BC government. At the time, 200 organizations had signed on to that letter in support. And uh, we're excited that now, two years later, we have about 545 organizations that have signed on, including yours, the BC Humanist Association. Thank you for your support. And of course, as the name clearly states, we are in emergency mode. We are long past the time for incremental action on climate change. We need our, our leaders, we need our institutions, we need our governments to recognize this situation for the emergency that it is. Now the Climate Emergency Unit um, has this list of six markers. How do you know if somebody if an institution is in emergency mode? Well, this list can help you uh, answer that question. First of all, somebody, a government, an institution that is in emergency mode will spend what it takes to win. We saw what happened when the pandemic struck and we saw uh, how much money the government suddenly had available to be able to help Canadians. Uh, we saw that very clearly. Uh, number two, create new institutions to get the job done. Shift from incentive-based and voluntary policies to mandatory measures. Tell the truth about the severity of the crisis. Communicate a sense of urgency. Leave no one behind. And five, it is cru crucial that Indigenous rights and title are, are being put at the forefront. Um, and I, I don't want to dwell too, too long on these markers, um, but they're uh, a really, um, you know, if you're ever in doubt and you're wondering, um, you know, 
is this policy a good one? Is this action plan strong enough? Um, come back to these markers and apply them. It's, it's really uh, telling, again, to see how the government responded when the pandemic hit and to see how they, how they took action. We saw for quite a, a while, the prime minister standing outside of his house, giving us these updates on what was happening with the pandemic. We have not seen anything similar to that when it comes to the climate crisis. We have not seen the government spending what it takes. Uh, we have seen them declaring a climate emergency, but their actions aren't adding up to their words. They're declaring uh, that we're in a climate emergency and then approving pipelines the next day. And that really sends mixed messages. Uh, it's not, it, it, they really don't make it clear to the general public that we are in the midst of a real emergency. Now, as I mentioned, the BC Climate Emergency Campaign came up with this list of 10 actions, 10 urgent actions that we sent to the provincial government. And I want to walk you through them um, because each of them are important. And of course, no one, no person, no group can focus on all 10 of these at the same time because it's, it's a lot to work with. Um, but each of them requires their own their own energy and their own their own commitment to them. The first action is to set binding climate pollution targets based on science and justice. And of course, it's one thing to set ambitious policy, uh, sorry, ambitious targets, but it's of course important that you are actually meeting them because if you are setting targets and failing to meet them year after year after year, uh, what are those targets actually doing? Again, as I said, if you are setting ambitious targets and then continuing to approve fossil fuel infrastructure, you're setting yourself up for failure. There's no way you're going to be meeting your targets. The second action is to invest in a thriving, regenerative, zero emissions economy. We're suggesting spending 2% of BC's GDP, which is about 6 billion every year, to climate action. Currently, the government is spending approximately one fifth of that. And as I highlighted here, hearkening back to the, the, the markers of emergency mode, spending what it takes is crucial when it comes to this. Action number three is to rapidly wind down all fossil fuel production and use. Uh, of course, this is uh, quite a self-explanatory one. Um, and it, it refers to not only oil and gas, but BC's biggest climate problem right now, which is LNG, liquefied natural gas. This is something that you hear um, touted as a climate solution everywhere you look these days. Uh, industry is pushing it forward, governments are pushing it forward. You're hearing all about LNG as a bridge fuel. And, and that is simply not the case, uh, LNG is fracked gas, it releases methane. We need to be rapidly, uh, immediately phasing out all fossil fuel uh, production and, and export, um, including that blade related to LNG. Similar, number four is about ending fossil fuel subsidies, making polluters pay, very important. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of Sue Big Oil, it's a campaign, campaign started by West Coast Environmental Law, where they are uh, basically taking the big polluters to court and trying to get them to pay their fair share of the damage that they are causing. Action number five, leave no one behind. I'm sure folks have heard about the call for a just transition. That's exactly what this action is calling for. Uh, we have a working group dedicated to this action specifically. They just came out with a, a policy brief a few months ago that they sent to the government um, detailing exactly what a just transition would look like. Happy to send that out if anybody's interested. Action number six, protect and restore nature. Um, you know, we're not only in a climate crisis, we are in the midst of a biodiversity crisis as well. Uh, 
uh, preserving and restoring natural ecosystems is crucial if we want to be winning this fight. Number seven, invest in local organic regenerative agriculture and food systems. So this relates to indigenous food sovereignty, sovereignty and food security, um, talking about the increase of plant-based foods and reducing food waste. Number eight, accelerate the transition to zero emission transportation. We know that transportation uh, makes up a large part of, of BC and the country's uh, GHG emissions. It is critical that we are ending, for example, highway expansion, putting all of that money, investing it into um, accessible and affordable uh, transportation, active transportation, rolling, walking, that sort of thing. Uh, we also have a working group dedicated to this action. Number nine is accelerate the transition to zero emission buildings. Uh, again, we have a working group for this one uh, where we are trying to ban all um, new buildings from being hooked up to gas. Finally, track and report progress on these actions every year. On the left here, you will see Clean BC. This is our province's climate plan. The updated one, which was released in 2021, was titled Roadmap to 2030. And on the right side here, you will see the cover of our climate action report card. And the BC Climate Emergency Campaign published this a year ago. We evaluated the BC government on its climate action in relation to those 10 actions that I just shared with all of you. The unfortunate outcome you'll see here. So they did make progress on four of the 10 actions, uh, but unfortunately on the remaining six, we assigned a failing grade. And uh, in, we go into detail on each of these actions in the report card, if you're interested in taking a look. Um, we're currently in the midst of creating our second annual report card, which we'll be releasing in the next few months. And hopefully we'll be seeing more progress taken on, on each of these 10 actions. So what has the BC Climate Emergency Campaign been up to over the last little while? We've been focusing on our uh, public education, shifting the public narrative, trying to get out there and get, get media attention, um, publishing op-eds, this purple document on the right is the Just Transition Policy Brief that our working group put out recently. In the summer, we held a press conference in front of Premier Eby's office. We are calling for a stronger climate plan, of course, and an end to fracking. We teamed up with Frack Free BC, which is a fairly new group that has come together in, in BC to call for an end to fracking. More or less on the cheeky side of things, we've been putting out some ad campaigns, uh, trying to counteract the rampant greenwashing that is going on right now from the oil and gas industry. And uh, as I mentioned, our Climate Action Report card, we are currently in the midst of um, preparing our second one, which will be out in November. So those are some of the things that the BC Climate Emergency Campaign has been working on. I'm happy to give more information about how folks can get involved in that um, and, and really appreciate the BC Humanists Association already being one of our organizational signatories. So to talk a little bit more specifically about the action that all of us can take. Of course, individual action is important. All of us can change our behavior in one way or another to be a little bit more climate friendly, whether that's um, flying less, switching to an electric vehicle, um, biking or walking more, you know, we all, we all know the drill. Uh, and, and of course, a lot of these behavioral changes um, require some, some amount of privilege, some amount of financial stability, uh, changing to an electric heat pump, for example, ref retrofitting, retrofitting our homes, excuse me. All of these things that we 
are actions that that you and I can take to try to have less of a harmful impact on the earth. And all of these actions are are important. The fact of the matter is, however, that what makes the biggest difference is collectively coming together to, to take systemic action. Uh, do any of you know that BP is actually, they are the ones who coined the term carbon footprint. Uh, and they did that in a very sneaky and successful way <laughs> to shift the blame from themselves onto the individual and onto the consumer so that we would then feel guilty about our own actions and spend all this time and energy and money trying to lower our carbon footprint instead of putting the blame on them, on the oil and gas industry, on, on the, the companies who are actually wreaking the most havoc on the planet. So it's important to really keep in mind who the true targets should be. And it's, it's sad to think that we are spending time feeling guilty about, uh, you know, flying to go visit our family or, or commuting to work because we have to, because we don't live nearby the workplace, when it is actually the corporations, the institutions, the oil and gas industry who are raking in the billions and billions of dollars in profits from enacting uh, climate chaos and, and causing this breakdown that we are now seeing. And I just I just really want to be hammering home this point uh, that we, we have to be targeting um, that the industry we have to be targeting the the big players here the banks like rbc who are again raking in billions of dollars of dollars in profits uh from fossil fuel financing uh shell for example who is profiting off this death and destruction that we are already seeing um and just keeping in mind this bigger picture you know you could you could Never drive a car again. You could live in complete darkness and, and never flick on another light switch. Uh, you could bring your carbon footprint down to zero. Uh, and yet the impact that that would have is absolutely minuscule when you think that the government any day can approve another gas or oil pipeline. Some of the actions that we at the BC Climate Emergency Campaign, and I would say the, the climate movement in general, um, like to propose are, are actions that try to get us outside of our individual uh, carbon footprint and try to you know, have the biggest reach and the biggest impact. Uh, meeting with your MLAs is something that we are always advocating for, and we have a toolkit prepared just for that to ease the process a little bit. So if that's something that you're interested in, just let me know and I can send that along. Our MLAs uh, are there to listen to their constituents. They want to hear from you. And it is, it is absolutely critical that they're hearing that folks care about climate action and that they're going to be holding them accountable. You can help grow the movement. For example, as I mentioned, we have these 545 organizations who have signed on. Uh, you can look, take a look on our website and see the complete list of organizations. And if you, if you know of any who are not on that list, send them our website. Uh, tell them that they can sign their organization on, become a signatory. That's extremely helpful. You don't have to go out and start your own climate group if you want to get involved. There are so many that you can join that are doing amazing work in so many different areas. You can write to your local city council. You can educate yourself on who the climate villains are. Environmental Defense recently uh, engaged in this really awesome campaign where they published a list of the worst climate villains 
those who are uh, wreaking the most havoc on the earth. And you can take a look at their campaign, that's environmental defense. And you can talk about it. Another climate scientist named Catherine Hayhoe has a book where she essentially uh, is advocating for everybody to be talking about climate change with everybody they know, with your friends, your family, your colleagues. Um, and she explains that we can be linking it to essentially everything. If your hobby is winter sports uh, or summer sports, if your hobby is food related, wine related, uh, birding related, you name it, there's always going to be a way to link it back to climate change and a way that it is going to be affected if it is not already affected by climate change. Ian mentioned uh, at the beginning, one of my hobbies is playing field hockey. And this past summer, we had quite a few practices where it was so smoky outside that we, it was canceled. And it just simply wasn't, it wasn't safe to be going outside and running around. Uh, you know, talk to your, your, your teammates about that sort of thing. So talking about it is, well, depending on who you're talking to, uh, could be an easy way to be bringing these conversations into your day-to-day -day life and, and making an impact. And you never know whose mind you're going to change on these things when you start talking to them about it. Now, very quickly, I wanted to run through some false solutions. Uh, and there might be differing opinions on some of these. I'm going to share my own opinions, which are, by the way, always evolving, I would say, as more information comes to light. Um, and as I said, again, I am not a climate scientist, so I do not want to claim expertise. But based on the experts that I have spoken to, uh, the, the talks I've attended, and the things I've learned through the workplace, um, uh, I will present uh, what I believe to be false solutions. The first of these, and the you know, one that we are hearing about all the time these days is carbon capture and storage, where you're sucking carbon uh, out of the air and injecting it deep into the earth to be stored. Um, this is a, a solution being put forth by the oil and gas industry. So you know already that it's not a true solution if they are advocating for it. Uh, but this is one that is extremely expensive, not uh, scalable, and uh, is failing left, right, and center. Um, CCS projects have been trying to get off the ground around the world and have been proven to be extremely ineffective. <laughs> uh, so that is most certainly, without a doubt, a false solution. Natural gas, I already talked about this briefly. Um, it should be called fracked gas or methane gas because it releases methane into the atmosphere, which is 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide. No way is that a carbon, so uh, sorry, no way is that a climate solution. Net zero by 2050, another thing that we are hearing all the time, a lot of companies are coming on board and saying that they are going to be going net zero by 2050. Not necessarily a bad thing, but if this is not accompanied by interim targets, for example, what are you going to do um, by 2030, by 2040? If you are simply setting this target for 2050, that is so far down the line that, uh, you know, how are you being held accountable? And I will bet you the people who are putting that forward are probably not going to still be working for that company in 2050. Hydrogen is a uh, so-called solution that we are hearing about more and more these days, and there are all different colors. There's blue hydrogen, which uh, is created through carbon capture and storage. There's brown hydrogen derived from coal. The list goes on, um, and there's a lot of debate around hydrogen going on right now. Uh, but I think for the most part, it is essentially a false solution. Um, carbon offsets, also something that we've heard about for a long time now, 
problem is that oftentimes they are problematic. For example, you are paying to have trees planted, and maybe those trees are being planted, but they are burning down in a wildfire the next year, or the land is being is set for de being deforested. Uh, so it's it's a really tricky one uh, that is often used to make people feel better <laughs> by saying that they invested in, the, in these carbon offsets when uh, really they are not actually part of the, the solution. And finally, geoengineering is one of the more fancy solutions that people like to talk about, which, for example, uh, well, it essentially involves um, uh, trying to change Earth's systems, for example, by injecting particles into the atmosphere, which mimic a volcanic eruption, which block the sun and have a cooling effect. The issue with something like that, as you might imagine that we don't know what the side effects of that could be. Uh, if you're blocking the sun and causing a cooling effect, a lot of things on the earth rely on sunlight. So, you know, what kind of ripple effect is that gonna have could be in fact quite disastrous. So that was a really, really quick rundown of a few of the false solutions that we're hearing about right now. Um, but of course, what do we actually need to be focusing on? There's a lot, and the answers are simple, and they are proven. Renewable energy, wind, solar, and hydro, uh, these energy sources and the technologies surrounding them, uh, the, the, the cost of implementing them have decreased incredibly quickly in the last few years. We are seeing a huge decline in cost. Uh, making it so much more realistic to be implementing these sorts of solutions. Um, we need to be electrifying everything. We need to be decarbonizing the grid. We need to be focusing on uh, implementing low emissions transportation systems, active transportation networks. We need to be focusing on, um, on transporting folks in accessible and affordable ways. And of course, we need to be focused on things like the circular economy uh, and going back to the idea of um, reuse, <laughs> uh, reducing. You know, it's not only about uh, production, 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 consumption, consumption, uh, and continuing in this, in this, on this path towards endless growth, uh, because that's simply not sustainable. Uh, the Earth is is reaching its limits. We are seeing it, it, it that it is unhappy and it is unhealthy. Uh, and I'm, I'm talking about all of these solutions and I haven't even gotten into uh, <laughs> the underlying crisis, uh, causes of these crises, crises that we're seeing, things like extractive colonialism and capitalism, um, et cetera. But uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, these are just some of, of the solutions that we need to be focusing on. Uh, we need to be moving away from the idea of, of these false solutions working. And uh, one, one easy trick that I can give is that if the oil and gas industry is proposing a solution, it's probably not a solution. And that's that's an easy way we can tell uh, if if this is going to be something that we can seriously trust or not. And I want to leave everybody off with this final quote from uh, by Rebecca Solnit, who says, "Ideas are contagious, emotions are contagious, hope is contagious, courage is contagious. When we embody these qualities or their opposites, we convey them to others." Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much for that, uh, Emiko. And I'm apologizing. I realized I should have actually clarified exactly how to pronounce your name so I didn't mess it up. I think I was close enough, I hope.